Welcome to the Creating Well Simplified Podcast. My name is Lauren Wells, here with my co-host, Chris Seveny. We're committed to providing you with the knowledge required to build wealth through real estate investing. Tired of consuming content about real estate? Stuck in analysis paralysis? Ready to do your first deal? As a member of our community, you will learn how to go from consuming content to taking that first step into the world of real estate investing. Our show is not about getting rich quick, but about providing you with the knowledge you need to take action. Join us as we speak with experienced investors who share action tips on how to escape the corporate world, start a thriving side hustle in the world of real estate, and go beyond your W-2 or 401k. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Creating Wealth Simplified podcast. Today, we have special guests, Tracy Z and Fred Rui. Tracy and Fred, how are you doing today? Good. We're doing great. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thanks. It's been actually long overdue to have you on the podcast. Um, Tracy and I have been on multiple speaking uh, events and so forth. And I've also been a part of their Cashflow Expo, which we'll talk a little bit about. And a reason I wanted to have Tracy and Fred on today is they are two of the most highly respected uh, note investors in the space. And for people who are listening, um, we have plenty of content as well as Fred and Tracy on what note investing is but it's a way to create some passive income for people to continue to build wealth. And interestingly enough, Fred and Tracy actually kind of the opposite of my investment strategy of non-performing notes. And I'll let you talk about a little bit about what you're working on today. Well, our specialty are performing seller financed first position real estate notes. That's sort of our sweet spot. That's what got us in the business back in the late 80s. And it, so we have done other types of notes, but I always joke and say, I got enough performing that go non-performing, I don't need to go out and look for them. <laughs> so how did you get into rolling back in time? Because you've been in this space for a really long time. Did you always start in that space of the performing seller finance type notes? Or did you start somewhere else in your real estate avenues? We were both different. I was living in California at the time and was actually just taking some night classes to try to learn to invest real estate. And I was looking at at different things as far as I was concerned. And during one week of that course, a gentleman by the name of John Richards was actually teaching the course who goes way back into the note industry, but he taught us the financial calculator and the idea of buying notes. So I was absolutely hooked. I mean, I just thought this was the coolest thing ever. You got the benefit of owning real estate or at least having real estate as your security and didn't have to worry about tenants and all the other stuff that went along with it. So that's kind of how I jumped into it. At that time, it was always on the performing side. I was only interested in looking for notes that are performing. A lot of great strategies in non-performing. It's just that you can do both. We just tend to stick to performing. We like the seller finance too, because we find if you go direct to the sellers that sold property and took back financing from the buyer that they are willing to sell at a discount, a little bit similar sometimes to discounts you might get on non-performing. For me getting started, I had a title and closing background and I went to work for a large institutional note investor that was buying these seller finance notes. And so for my first 10 years, I got a great education working to invest their money, running the closing department, underwriting, helping with marketing. And during that time, I couldn't buy a note and I so wanted to buy a note. And the reason was they felt it was a conflict of interest. So I did the traditional invest in real estate. I bought real estate. I had tenants. I have all kinds of tenant horror stories. I bought with seller financing. I sold with seller financing, but I couldn't buy an existing note at a discount. So it was in 97 that Fred and I started our own company and left the corporate note investing world that we started buying for ourselves, mostly using our self-direct retirement account, then moving into lines of credit and some other avenues. So today, fast forward to today, We still buy and sell seller finance notes. We do it on a smaller scale than we did. We're more of a private investor scale now. And we still love it. And there's a lot of opportunity out there right now, especially in the current environment. Mm -hmm. And just want to rewind a little bit, because I know, Tracy, you mentioned like your background and kind of title and stuff. But Fred, you didn't come from a real estate background, correct? No, no, not at all. I mean, there was zero real estate background in there. I was interested in a lot of stock market stuff, which I still am. I mean, we've been in this industry for so long. I mean, it's, I'm not ashamed. I was pretty young. I mean, I was probably 27 years old when I came into it. So it's like, oh, I mean, who at 27 knows what the hell they want to be for the rest of their lives. <laughs> so uh, that was my introduction to it. Look, I think everybody conceptually knows they want to have some aspect of real estate, whether it's simply just owning their own property 
or mm-hmm. everybody has the idea of investment. Back then, 80s, it was all the infomercials of some dude late night in a courtyard going, I own that house and that house and that house and that house and that house. And they've got tenants in all of them. But then you learn as you deep dive into it, you're like, well, yeah, what are you doing? Two are vacant or three of them need a new roof or something like that. So you start to kind of scratch behind the surface a little bit on some of that stuff. But yeah, that was my introduction to real estate. So I did have rental property scenarios and did have the horror stories, but that was very brief since I was able to learn notes so quickly or be introduced to notes so quickly, I should say. So what gets me even more frustrated is I think you might be a few years slightly elder to my age and you got in 97. I started real estate in 97 and I didn't learn about notes till like 2013 or 15. My whole career was spent in real estate and I didn't even know about notes and people who are not in real estate have found out about it at a young age. It kind of like burns me a little bit because (laughs) when, when you're in the business, you're only taught like certain things, no different than job to job, which the 401k, which, oh, I can't self direct that. You got to do this. So I just wanted to share with people about this that, A, it doesn't matter what profession you're in, you can get into notes. I'd recommend that you have some financial acumen as it relates to numbers in being able to use Excel or calculator and understand some aspects of finance, but you don't have to be in real estate to be a note investor. You mentioned seller financed a few times. Can you explain to people who aren't familiar with the term seller financing and explain the type of loans and the process that you go through? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. It's a bigger industry than people realize as far as the existence. So roughly... 6% of all transactions, and it varies depending on the year, but roughly between 4 and 6% of all real estate transactions involve some sort of seller carryback financing. And whenever, like you said, everybody asks you, well, what's that? What's that? It's like, we've all seen the for sale by owner signs. And that just means they're willing to sell it. They're basically just trying to bypass a real estate agent. But then the other sign, which is the owner will finance. And that just means that you're going to give your down payment to the owner of the house and you're going to make the payments to the owner. So you might agree on, hey, I'm going to give you $10,000 down and I'm going to give you $800 a month for 30 years. And that's a note. And that's been created. And there's a lot of people that sell properties for that reason, either by need, because that's the only way they can move their property. It kind of gets them a little bit more people looking at it. Or it's an obscure property. Maybe it's a little bit more rural. Maybe it's a little bit harder to move. But a lot of times what happens is somebody sells that and carries back a note and they're getting good money. I mean, if they wrote the note at seven, eight, nine percent, whatever it is, they're earning that interest. And that may be better than what they could have done with the money anyway. But typically what happens is, is something changes in their life at some point. They want to buy another house. They have medical bills. They want to you know, send a kid to college, whatever it may be. And that's the point where we come in because they want to liquidate that note. And they can go back to the person paying them, but that person only has to pay what's in the contract. So that's the existence of a note. And that's how we step in and buy it. We typically buy them at a slight discount. What do you think? I think it's a good business. <laughs> I would well, still be doing, doing it for 30 it for, years. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you've been doing it for 30 years, so something's got to be working. And it's like they mentioned, you know, it's very different from the non-performing side where that's typically for people, that's institutional paper. Most of the time that gets originated, securitized and sold its way down a chain. And then eventually whoever owns it doesn't feel it's fit for their portfolio and then we'll liquidate it. So it's really a different avenue. So I'm sure a lot of people probably ask the first question of how do you find these people that are seller financing? That's a really great question. So last year that we have the stats for, so actually 2021, I know last year's 2022, we're waiting to compile those stats. Yeah. We do these studies every year. And the last full year we have them for, it was 27 billion with a B of seller finance paper that was created. And that is paper that was a deed of trust or mortgage. So a deed gets recorded from the seller to the buyer and a note gets signed back from the buyer to the seller. And they also sign a deed of trust or a mortgage depending on the state. And that gives them a lien against the real estate. So if the buyer doesn't pay, the seller can take back the real estate just like a bank would. So when those documents get recorded in the county courthouse, the county records for that county in that state where the property is located, that becomes public record. And so you can search out lists of people who owned the property, sold it, and took back Mm -hmm. a mortgage or took back a deed of trust. And it's in their name as an individual Mm -hmm. or their LLC and not Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Mr. Cooper, any of those types of institutional type names. So that is one method to find these people is to market to them through direct mail or direct response, people who sold, taken back payments over time. There are other ways too: online marketing, pay-per-click, 
real estate mm-hmm. investor clubs, self-directed IRA events. There's funds that invest in these. Some people prefer to invest in a fund than own the individual asset themselves. So there are other ways, but that's sort mm-hmm. of been one of the main components of how we've found mm-hmm. sellers that sold and took back mm-hmm. financing. Okay. So 27 billion, just want to kind of reiterate that for the listeners. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a big yeah. number. So say you have a hundred thousand dollars laying around, which is a lot of money. It you is. Know, you're basically at like 0.003% of the entire market. So you're like a blip on the map. And it's, yeah. it's very similar with the other types of note investing of people realizing, you know, secondary markets. And like you said, the seller financing and non-bank traditional bank lending, it's actually a significant number and I think last I heard the mortgage industry itself for real estate is what a $16 trillion industry, I think. So, yeah. I mean, it's one of the largest drivers of GDP in the nation. So it's interesting the ways because I think people don't realize how much public information is actually available on somebody. Yeah. And that was one of the scariest things when I got into note investing was, wow, like there's a lot of stuff out there that I didn't realize. Was that surprising to you back in uh, when you started? <laughs> I mean, I think one of the most surprising things was, is that information largely has has always been public as far as courthouse and stuff. But what the game changer was, is when they came online. So you used to basically hire somebody to go into a courthouse in a rural area or in a semi-rural area. And literally, I mean, some of them would get on literally the microfish things on their little slide <laughs> decks, but they go in there and they would get the name. So the names were there. They just weren't accessible from afar. And so the big game changer was really as more and more of these counties come online, and now you can literally just go out there and search it and find it. So that was kind of the biggest advancement, I think, in our industry. Matter of fact, I think there's only, what is it, 4% of counties aren't online or something like that? I can't remember. There's a very small number. Our number every year gets more and more exact because there's only so many counties that are really offline. So that was kind of a big game changer as far as accessibility to that information. Mm -hmm. And there's two other areas, just uh, since we're talking about where do you find these. So we've talked about what you talked about, Chris, the institutional paper that trickles down Mm -hmm. and then the seller finance paper. You also have people out there that are private lenders that are making loans to other investors for investment type property. And so they're creating their own paper specifically. And that is another large market that I think is is equal to those other two in the private investor arena. And then we have a whole nother category and that's all the financing that takes place that's not a public record. So there are a lot of unrecorded contract for deeds, lease options, options to buy, things that are kind of floating around out there that haven't quite turned into a public record transaction. And a lot of that happens as well. You've got business financing. So business notes, people sell businesses and take back paper. And that is not when real estate is involved. There's a big number of those. People sell mobile homes. They sell automobiles that aren't attached to real estate. They finance those. So there's a lot of private financing out there when you add it all together that I believe we're a much bigger industry than people realize. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. So I wanted to kind of turn a little bit of, could you share with the listeners what a hypothetical sample deal looks like of property value, loan amount, principal and interest payment? Is it typically 30 years, rough ballpark discounts, and just kind of a, an average deal? And again, I just want listeners to realize it fluctuates significantly based on many, many, many factors. It's kind of like saying, how much is it going to cost to renovate a house or put a new kitchen in? It's very similar with a note, but just I think there's some basics that can probably be provided, correct? I think that we start with our ideal, right? I mean, if we had an ideal, we'd love to see 20% down, Mm -hmm. 30-year term, 10% face interest rate. We'd like to see that the buyer can afford to make the payments and has Mm -hmm. income. We'd like to see good credit on behalf of the buyer, but we do lots of deals with no credit and poor credit if they have some redeeming factors. We'd like to see some seasoning on it, meaning they've made a few payments. We'd like to see that the paper was properly prepared and all the disclosures were there. You know, that's like the ideal world. And in those ideal worlds, you might get to pay 90 to 95 cents on the dollar. And then there's all this reality where people had poor credit and they didn't put much down. There hasn't been much seasoning. And in those cases, then we would pay less. We might pay 70 cents on the dollar or 80 cents on the dollar, or we might Say we only want to be in at 50% of the property value, but we'd offer a partial. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about how you might come in and do a partial in that situation? Yeah. So let me just do a 100,000, 12% on the normal one. So I don't have a calculator on the board here, but I'll just say, just so everybody kind of understands on a transaction, 
if we had a property that sold for $120,000, say, and I'm actually keeping the numbers pretty low. I mean, obviously where you are, they may be higher, but maybe we had a property sell for 120,000 and they put down $20,000. That leaves a $100,000 note. And let's just say they agreed to do that note for 30 years. And let's see, they agree to have it at 10% interest. That creates a monthly payment of 877.57. And that's a 10% note. So if I wanted to earn 10% of my money, then I would pay $100,000 for that note. Since we buy things at a slight discount, if I can pay less money for the same cash flow due, then my return is going to be higher than the face rate of that note. And like I said, this is a lot easier on the board, but just so everybody has, has a kind of an idea of it. So that person has a hundred thousand dollar cash flow. If I pay eighty five thousand three hundred sixteen dollars for it, I'm going to get the next three hundred sixty payments of eight seventy seven fifty seven, and I'm going to get a twelve percent return on my money on the investment. And that's how we do it. So now, when you take eighty five thousand and you divide that by the value of the property. You can see why we start to like this industry because I'm only in $85,000 to a property that sold for 120. So now you can see that I feel pretty comfortable on my loan to ratio or my investment to ratios because I know that I've got this buffer that something goes wrong. I'm like the bank. I have the ability to take it back. I can then resell it and create another note or I can just sell the property outright, whatever it might be. Yeah. And that's one thing for us with our latest fund, trying to educate people because everyone right now is concerned home prices, home prices, home prices. And we then educate them by we're not originating the loan today and paying par and getting it at a 5% or 10% of the down payment. Like you said, if you said, I'll just use the easy number, say you paid 80,000 for that and it's a $120,000 house, you got 33% equity. Um, right. I think even during the downturn, I think the largest housing decline in an annual period was I think like 12 or 13%. Now overall it was greater, but the other component that I think people need to understand about this is home prices may go down. Most people probably think they are, but if your house goes down and my house goes down, it goes down as long as I have a job and can pay my mortgage. Most people, that's the key attributor to note investing is really it's the person, the borrower and having that job or that income versus housing going up or down. Now, they may influence their decisions on what they do with the property if they go delinquent, but most people have the job, they're going to keep paying the mortgage. Would you agree? Yeah. And I think the other thing about that is that what's great about our industry is we can minimize our exposure. So Tracy alluded to partials. That was an example of just buying the whole mm -hmm. thing, but I don't have to buy the whole note. I can buy part of them. You want to talk about the partial? Yeah. And I agree with you wholeheartedly, Chris. That's been mm -hmm. our experience as well, is that people want to stay in their home and make their payments. Mm -hmm. And as Fred mentioned, we sometimes do partials. So if there's a 30-year payment stream on a note, we might buy the next 15 years. And so that minimizes the discount to the seller, minimizes our exposure. And then we collect those payments and then we assign and turn the note over back over to the seller and they collect the last 15, or maybe they want to sell another 15 years. <laughs> so there's lots of ways to do this industry. I think, as you pointed out from the very beginning, Chris, if people just understand the calculator and the finances, and this is not to scare people, you don't have to be a math whiz, but you do want to understand how to make your money work for you, right? Consider your dollars out there as soldiers and you want to put them into work and to action. And so I think that's one of the reasons that we're passionate about sharing information. And one of the reasons I created the how to calculate cash flows is because people were afraid of the calculator and they didn't want them to be. I know it looks scary when you look at a financial calculator and you're right, you can do it in Excel. I don't care what you use. I'm not saying you got to use a certain thing, but there's just five keys on there. There's just five little keys up here. If you just learn those five keys, I promise it'll change your life as Fred mentioned earlier. And it's interesting you mentioned partials. We're not going to dive too deep because we could spend hours on here. Yeah, you can. A quick story I'll mention about partials is, so I went to an engineering school and we joke, I was a civil engineer and all you need to do to graduate is learn you can't push on the rope and you know what flows downhill. And a, lot my, <laughs> and a lot of my friends are like chemical engineers and working on like Hubble telescopes and inventing all this crazy stuff. And I remember talking about them during COVID because we all got back together and stuff more often. And I was explaining to them partials and I was explaining to them how some of these notes I was buying non-performing at a discount, getting them re-performing season for a year and then selling a partial off on them and basically selling the partial for more than what I bought the note for. Right. And I'm explaining to us and their heads just exploded. They're like, you can't, how can this even be fathomable? I'm like, just math. It's math. I mean, it's really breaking right. it down. 
So kind of rolling into that, you mentioned a few things and you've been in the business a while. You also do a lot of education for people, correct? Yes, it's a passion of ours. And we feel like after doing it this long, somebody taught us, both of us had a mentor that taught us this industry. And we hope if we can just pass on some of that knowledge to people that we just have this whole new group of people that are out there that'll continue it on. I mean, every year, I think we get bigger and bigger that there's more private investors out there that are influencing this economy. And I think anytime we can take that into our own hands that we all uh, rise above. And I can say this because I don't have like training programs and stuff, but if you're looking at getting some education, A, you know, do your due diligence, especially in the note investing space, because Absolutely. there are a lot of people out there that I would not recommend people use for education. And your group has been around a long time. They're very well respected. I have not taken the group, so I've never given them a dollar or they're not paying me for anything. But a lot of people that I've spoken with or bought notes from or sold notes from, I ask them, I always ask people, hey, where'd you learn? Where'd you learn? So I can kind of push people. And basically, you know, your group has gotten that some of the highest reviews. People did wish that uh, you did some non-performing stuff as well. Yeah, no, we do. We do get that. We do get that. Well, thank you, Chris. That's We appreciate that. One of the things we have coming up, just the education, we actually like sharing a lot of free information and we have Cashflow Expo coming up. Do you want to talk about that, Fred? Cashflow Expo is now in its fifth year. It's a, it's an annual event. Every year I say I'm not going to do it the following year because it's a lot of work behind the scenes and it is free for everybody. The idea came over just the idea of events being online where people couldn't get on planes and go to conventions. So what we did is we basically created a three-day event. We call it Cashflow Expo. It's predominantly real estate and note focused. But I'd say that at least a third, if not a little bit more, tends to be fringe items. Like there's even stuff on stock markets and there are things like that. So it's a great place to go and get an overview of different things from, and we vet all the speakers. We know all the speakers. They're not allowed to sell. So we do pre-record most of them. We've done some stuff live before, but we typically pre-record them just because if you're trying to rope in 30 sessions, 25 speakers, plus a couple panels and ask everybody to have Wi-Fi and everything ready to go and remember the time zone, forget it. Um, <laughs> the biggest thing we get is people go, hey, well, you should do it all live. And I'm like, no, it's already a lot of work on the pre-recorded. But basically, you can watch for three, all three days. These are top people in their field. They might be in delinquent. They might be performing notes. They might be lenders. They might be just mom and pop that just you know lend money once in a while. They might be running a fund. And you can watch whichever ones you want. It's February 9th. 10th and 11th this year. We leave them all online for 72 hours because that's a lot of content to take in, but you can watch it for 72 hours. If you want and there's no obligation, you can upgrade to a VIP pass, which will give you a copy of all the recordings on an online portal. And that's uh, usually $79 or $97, depending on when you know there's an early bird and another one. But for 100 bucks, you can actually watch all these sessions whenever you want to watch them or rewatch them. It's a great lineup of speakers. Like I said, we vet them all and they're not allowed to sell. They're, this isn't a pitch fest where they, we've all been to that convention where someone's like, you know, get to the end of it. And it's like, hey, for $17,000, you get to join this or pipe that. They're not allowed to do that. They can give away something for free if they want, but nobody's allowed to sell or do anything like that. And Chris, we know you're going to be a returning yeah. speaker. Yeah. So we're excited to have you speak again. What are you talking on this year? So I'm going to kind of rehash from a few years ago, and I'm speaking on how you can lose money in 2023. <laughs> <laughs> so, and again, typically a lot of people will show you how to do certain things. Like you mentioned, they're all great speakers. I kind of like to zig one other zag and also share some of the horror stories of here are some of the things you also needed to look out for as you're learning through and learning through the process. And actually two or three years ago, when I did the first one of how to lose money in notes, technically it's kind of turned myself into a multi-million dollar business because Lauren Wells, who's now my VP of Investor Relations, saw that and basically started reaching out to me, she goes, wow, I actually like this guy because he's just brutally honest. I joke, she stalked me. She really didn't, but (laughs) messaged me on LinkedIn and wanted to connect. And I basically started educating her on more on notes and then timing was right. So I actually brought her on board to assist with my note portfolio. And then when we launched my latest fund, she has background in IT sales and a lot of sales experience, brought her on board to be one of my partners in in our latest fund. It's all because of Cashflow Expo. Hey, wow. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I didn't know if you knew that story or not. So that's a great it. story. Lauren, tell me. Uh, she said a quest event or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought that's a great, great story. So I like the slant of 
showing what goes wrong because look what you know i mean everybody can make it all roses and there are things that can go wrong but i tend to learn more by my own mistakes or other people's mistakes than i do the wins the wins are easy i mean if you win you win it's like everybody goes to vegas thinking oh my gosh it's like i can win it's like well they didn't pay for this town on winners so how do you avoid losing what can you do for money management the essence of like note buying which we're talking about is is not that hard it's really not that's you know and everybody's like oh what's new and what's new and it's like it's kind of the same thing it's always been but you do need to know those things and to your point you need to know what to avoid what to look out for is is just as important Mm -hmm. yep so kind of jumping back a little bit kind of speaking about that and what can go wrong what are some of the things for people who may actually are listening that do some seller financing when you're reviewing the paper what are you some of the things you see that's incorrect or give pause to say, hey, look, I can't pay this much because this happened or this wasn't being done with the note. I'm sure that's occurred many times. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, with seller financing, there are a lot of times title deficiencies. So we are big on always getting a new commitment for title insurance. So mm-hmm. that will protect you. And then we pay for a title policy. So we are insured. If there's an existing mortgagees policy, mm-hmm. like there is when you buy institutional paper, then we can just mm-hmm. get an update and, and get mm-hmm. that endorsed over. But title deficiencies, lost originals, like lost original notes. Sometimes we'll see they're not keeping the property insured for fire and hazard. We have a couple of interesting stories through our note buying experience of problems with that. Maybe the buyer borrower really isn't making payments and the seller just said they were and they don't have a third party servicer. So we're always trying to make sure we get verifiable payment histories. You want to talk about a couple others? Yeah, I mean, you took the big ones. I mean, basically, at the end of the day, I I would say the 30,000 foot level is to just check something out. So if you're going to have an opportunity to buy a note or whatever, don't take everything at face value. We've had people we work with at years and I'm still going to go make sure I find out the value of the property is really what they say the value of the property is. I'm really going to look at the pay history and make sure the pay history is what he said it was. A lot of that stuff, you just can't cut corners. There's a checklist. Matter of fact, we literally have a checklist for our members that basically says, here's our checklist of closing a note and go through all of these. And if you do, look, I mean, something can always happen, but you can really mitigate those problems. Whether you're buying performing or non-performing, there's a checklist of what you're going through and and the nice thing is there's things offset and you can take chances and you can get a higher return for a higher risk. But there's a point where higher return, if you don't get paid, then it wasn't worth going for a higher return. 20% of zero is still zero. Yeah, right? so, uh, so, but yeah, I'd say a lot, just the paperwork and stuff like that, just really just double checking values, whatever it may be. Delinquent taxes are another one that we That's sometimes one, yeah. have to get cured. I would say when we're talking with taxes, title insurance, those tend to be the, the big three. And then, yeah, so insurance, uh, taxes title. Those are always the ones that you know, you're looking at the payer, you're looking at the property and you're looking at the paperwork. So I like threes, the power of threes. So those threes on the due diligence side and the three on the performance side are big in our book and our checklist kind of center around those because there's a lot of balancing of the scales when we buy these notes. So we don't expect every one of them to be perfect. Yeah. And you don't, you don't have to know all that stuff. I mean, you can hire somebody, you can hire a closer. There's some very people in our industry that freelance that will close deals for you that will put the package together for you and you know tell you what you've got and so you don't have to be an expert in all these areas i found you really just got to be a manager for the most part and again you got to be able to run numbers and so forth but like you said there's people who will handle that closing aspect of it you have attorneys as well who handle a lot of that collateral reviews and make sure you know hey i'm looking at a title report i don't know what this says like somebody will review that for you a lot of those aspects what i've seen is because And again, the quality of paper, I think, is very different from what you see compared to some of the stuff I've seen. But some of the seller finance stuff that I've seen in the past, what I've seen is a newly originated loan. They didn't even qualify or get any information from the borrower. And then I'll go online and look in like a prop stream or some Zillow or something. And the house was listed for sale for 120000 It was on the market for seven months during like 2021, where, <laughs> you know, basically a port john could sell for right, $100,000 right. in most places. <laughs> and next thing you know, it was one hundred and twenty, And then it went to 175000 seller finance. And I'm like, okay, if the house didn't sell for 120, right, right. now it's I'm like, what's the value of the house? And people inflate that number, which causes the when you look at it, now they're like, well, the house is really only worth about a hundred. So I need to still and you didn't run like credit or even check if, if the borrower has a job. I I can't even price this paper. Right. So that's one of the things we see a lot from some of the sellers that we work with. And again, that's I think more of the I'll call it. 
don't want to say paper institutional, creators. but we'll call yeah, them paper creators. <laughs> paper creators compared to some of the one-off people. Another question I was going to ask is primarily, do you focus on property with a home on it or do you do land and manufactured homes as well? Just curious for your portfolio. And does your risk model and pricing change based off of the type of what's sitting on the property? Yes and yes. So we'll look at <laughs> anything. What we, I mean, single family residence, owner occupied or being used as a rental, mobile homes attached to land. Tracy tends to think that she likes mobile homes that aren't attached to land, like just the mobile homes. So we have a good debate about that at the household. <laughs> land only is fine. But, you know, as the risks go up, SFR tends to be the safest. And as the risks go up, you usually get a better return if that's your hot button. But for also becomes investment to value. So how much do I have in it? So how much I'm willing to put into a house versus how much I'm willing to put into raw land are directly related to if things go south, to your point earlier in the show where you talked about, you know, values going down and stuff like that, the fastest, hardest, bigger percentage hit is going to be raw land. That property that was worth $100,000, everybody's like, well, that can't be worth $50,000 the next day. Yes, it can. So that means I'm going to base my ratios on investment closer to that. What do you think? I 100% agree. And that's when partials really play a starring leading role in us buying mobile home and land or land or even mobile home only is because then we're putting a lesser amount in making sure it performs well, the seller has something to protect also on the other side. And so that's when partials really play a big role. And to Fred's point, I've got a six lots in my self-directed IRA that I bought a note in before 2008. And I thought I was in at 50% investment to value. And then I had to take the note back with the deed in lieu because the people couldn't make their payments. And that property did go down below what I had invested, even though I thought it was in at 50% of what the property value was. So what do I do? I hang on to it till the values come back because it's land and I don't have to worry about maintenance and upkeep. I just got to pay the inexpensive real estate taxes. So there's ways to work yourself out of those situations, but you've got to be prepared for them. So if somebody came to me, if it's my sister, my mom or daughter or something, I wouldn't say, oh, run out and do land and mobile homes. Like That's what you do when you get a little more appetite, a little more experience you want. You're looking for some fun. Right. That's that's yeah. your biggest money. It's not I'm saying you can tell people start on delinquent. I mean did. <laughs> <laughs> so one person wants is not, but I mean the traditional performing seller finance notes that are on a home are definitely a safer place to start than some of these other things. So, Fred, I can share a little story with you because Tracy's affinity with mobile homes not attached to property. Here's one for you. Scratch your heads. So we had a delinquent loan the uh, last year, year before. Basically foreclosed on the property and the deed had listed the serial number or whatever for a manufactured home as well, but it wasn't attached. So we foreclosed on that and basically we turned around and we sold it to somebody else who went there and started fixing it up. And all of a sudden, the title agent calls us and says, you sold them a manufactured home that you don't own. I'm like, what are you talking about? The title had never gotten retired at mm-hmm. the county. So even though it was on the deed, because it didn't get retired on the county, the county actually was sending out two tax bills. So they were sending a tax bill out for personal property and one for real property. Mm -hmm. So the personal property is going to the actual somebody from long ago. The real property is coming to me. And I'm like, this, they're like, it was told at tax sale. I'm like, nope, here's like the tax bills. (laughs) What happened is they sold it, the personal property, and we foreclosed on it. So now the question was, who owns this? Because we foreclosed right, on them. Right. They sold their personal property. Essentially, we end up paying off the person who bought it at tax sale because right. they actually foreclosed before we foreclosed. So they actually came in first. But I'll tell you, you want to talk about a mess. Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah. That is an interesting one. So when we do mobile and land, we do look to see if the mobile home title has been retired and it really is fixed. And if it's not, then we get the mobile home tax bill because it is, you're right, it's personal versus real or they call it chattel or personal property. And then we have to get a mobile home title because if it hasn't been retired, it's actually titled very similar to a car. I didn't know that. <laughs> so, yeah, well, now you do, yeah. right? That's part now, of the whole yeah, learning process. Now, you can now, work now, that now, into cash flow expo speech of the things not yeah. to not how, how to lose money. Although you didn't yeah. lose money, so that's good. <laughs> um, I had to give a little bit more up. I mean, still, yeah, still was a good deal, but yeah, I mean, but that is a perfect way of not realizing yeah. that because you might think 
if it wasn't on deeded to the property, it's just there. And actually I have back to another one that I have one in West Virginia right now that's in bankruptcy and they're trying to cram us down even though we're in first position because they're saying it's personal property. But this one's actually affixed. I mean, it's got a foundation mm. with a basement and you're yeah. still trying to say it's personal, but- Well, they so can't, they can't with that, but yeah. So our um, debate is over these mobile homes that are on rented lots. That's where we get our, um, our debate because okay. they truly are personal property. I don't like things that move. <laughs> that's how I define it. Mobile homes by nature is like mobile comes from. Yeah, that's where the mobile comes from. I don't like boats, planes, mobile homes. She's like, well, no one's gonna get up in the I'm middle of the night. No one's gonna get in the middle of the night. But you know what? I say that there's a ton of money to be made at it. And mobile homes, if you ever go back and read like Lonnie Scruggs, who originally I think John Fedra's John Fedra, John Fedra speaking. I mean, your returns on them are huge because they're super low dollar. You get people in there that look, I mean, the ability for affordable housing. I mean, it's the last line of affordable housing at this point that people are going, hey, and they're not concerned with how much they're going to buy them for. They're concerned with what their payment's going to be. And it's just like buying a car. People go yeah. to dealership and it's like, hey, your payment's this month. People really don't care what the price of that car is. They're just like, what's that monthly payment? And it's the same thing, I think, on mobile homes, which is probably not the best financial advice that people get because they their interest rate or whatever terms might not be the best. But you know, that's what people are looking for is how much can I afford? And that's really what happens with housing anyways. People now look at, okay, sure. I can afford this much for a house and so forth. I see more home mobile homes that have a car worth more money than the mobile home than I do the reverse. <laughs> so is that old mobile home that's got this really expensive car payment? Car. Hey, yeah. I've seen some homes where the cars have been worth more than homes. So. No doubt. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's yeah. just, yeah. He's saying you, you get, stick homes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get certain parts of Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, some of that Midwest. And again, I'm on the East Coast and I've always been on the East Coast where when I started looking in note investing and realizing like some of these loans are buying were $7,500,000 properties, I'm like, you can't get that anywhere in the country. And I'm like, actually, there's a, a lot of the country where you can Still get. Can. Yep, so... But as we wrap up this episode, first again, thank you for coming on. What's one thing you can lead, give the listeners some advice that want to get involved in some type of past investing? What's a recommendation or a tip or a book that you give people? Well, I recommend they go to cashflowexpo.com because it's uh, all these different cash flows. They're welcome to visit our website, nodeinvestor.com, because uh, we give away lots of free information there, over 300 mm -hmm. articles. I know that you have a great podcast. There's just so much great information out there. I was going to say those things, but <laughs> there's a lot out there. I think, I think, Chris, you mentioned it early, whether you want to notes and you come to us or you go to somebody else. I think your point is, is that just go out there and learn, just go to some of the boards, go to some of the groups, learn around, do some digging, do your due diligence on who you want to learn from, who doesn't require all this money up front or whatever, you know, all the, all the weird things that go along with that. And there's just so much free stuff out there now. I mean, to think of right now, you can search on the internet. So you just sift through that, like Cashflow Expo to start with there or podcasts and things like that, I think are a great place to start. And also kind of pursue what sounds interesting to you. None of it's necessarily super hard. It's just a process. And if it doesn't sound interesting, then you know what? There's a lot of ways to be involved, either whether you want to be passive or you want to be in a fund, you want to just own your own notes, you want to go market for your own notes. There's a lot of different ways to be involved and get the benefits of that without getting hung up on something that you don't like. So just find out which sounds interesting. Yeah, that's great advice about doing what you love and you know don't do something you don't like. But also, I think, realize what works for somebody else doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you. Perfect example is like, I got into notes because we had two young children at the time. We live in a very expensive market and we were both working our W-2. So to try and buy conventional real estate, which was my background, that's what I had been doing for 15 plus years, you know, just wasn't logistically couldn't be done or we couldn't find the time for it. And that's where then I looked at tax liens and I was like, ah, no, pass those on quickly. But then tax liens led me to find notes and notes was like the perfect for me because I love numbers. I love math. I feel I'm good at that and calculating and understanding risk and basically just fell naturally into that. So for people you do something you're passionate about. Thank you. If people do want to, you mentioned, you know, Cashflow Expo and NoteInvestor.com. Is there any ways, anything else you'd like to share about how people can reach out to you? No, those are the two big ones. I mean, we're pretty, you know, NoteInvestor.com. You can send us a message on there if you want. Cashflow Expo, which is February 9th, 10th, and 11th. If you go to Cashflow Expo, you can register for a free ticket. So you'll get the links to where the live events are going to be. Thanks for having us, Chris. Thanks for being part of this industry. Yep. Thank you. And we'll have all that information as well in the show notes so people can click on it. And thank you for everyone for listening to this episode of Creating Wealth Simplified. Thank you. 
Thank you for joining Lauren and I on this episode of the Creating Wealth Simplified podcast. Each week, we bring you expert education, experience, and information in a digestible format to help you identify investment opportunities so you can build wealth through real estate and take action toward your financial goals. Enjoy the show, share with a friend or subscribe to the show, and leave us a review. 